Thanks so much, everyone, for watching. We've got an epic lineup tonight of speakers. We've got an awesome panel here. Amazing group of functional doctors, technology activists uh, for here for Elite Forward in Medicine. You know, our goal is to make it easy for practitioners to learn in community. This ecosystem that is being set up by the meetup groups, we believe will be the future ecosystem of this evolved primary care network, and it all revolves around you. Welcome to the Functional Forum. Thanks for joining us in the charge to accelerate the evolution of medicine. Please welcome your host, James Masco. Hello, everyone. Welcome to a very special Functional Forum. Excited to have you here. Um, it is March the 1st, 2021, and uh, we've got a great show lined up for you here this evening. Boom. All right, welcome everyone. James here, excited here for another episode of the Functional Forum. Uh, we are talking about the reinvention of medicine. This is the third in the series. Tonight, we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into the microbiome with Dr. Tom O'Brien. Uh, Dr. O'Brien is one of the only people to have hosted a Functional Forum. Um, if you saw the India clips there at the beginning, a couple of years ago, he went to India and he hosted a Functional Forum there that was amazing uh, with Dr. Yehuda Schoenfeld. It's a great one if you want to go back and watch um, that episode. And then we're also going to have Dr. Christine Burke, who is one of the few physicians who hosted a functional forum style meetup for other clinicians, even before the functional forum came along. And um, is one of my favorite doctors. She's local uh, to me here in Sacramento now. And um, we dived into a topic that's not often talked about, which is how does toxicity affect specifically the gut and the microbiome? So we're talking about the reinvention of medicine. Later on, I'm gonna share a little bit about uh, what's going on with the podcast next year. Um, I think you're really gonna like, but let's jump into a couple of things here. So, um, you know, a warm welcome to everyone who's watching in a meetup. We've got some exciting meetup stuff coming um, very soon. But big news, I had a daughter this week, last Thursday. I had my second daughter. She's called uh, Ruby Maskell. I'm very, very happy. Uh, as you can probably tell, I'm excited. You know, in some countries they give you paternity leave, but you know, here in America they don't. So I'm doing the functional forum four days later. Only joking, I love doing the forum. So I'm here and I'm excited to be here. That's her on the right. Um, on the left is my daughter, Kaliana, who was born uh, about eight months before the very first functional forum. And her, you know, if you look back at different forum photos and videos and the tour and all that kind of stuff, you can just follow her like growing up with the functional forum. So uh, this is my new daughter, Ruby Maskell, and uh, my, mo my wife and I are very excited. Thank you all uh, for your support on social media. And otherwise, um, you know, it means a lot. So super excited about that. Um, let's jump into some content. So Dr. Tom O'Brien, you know, many of you have learned from him uh, throughout the years. Uh, he's a great speaker. And uh, he actually became not a first time dad, but a new dad this year with uh, his new wife, Marzi. Um, and it's their first child together. And so when I interviewed him about this, uh, I think he was just a few weeks after uh, his wife giving birth. So let's start with that. Um, just a couple of guys having kids uh, talking about the microbiome. So enjoy. So a warm welcome back to the show, Dr. Tom O'Brien. Welcome, Doc. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to be with you, James. So just a first starting point, you know, you're one of the only people that ever co-hosted a functional forum and you've been a friend of the functional forum really since the beginning. First, a hearty congratulations on your new addition to your family. Oh, thank you so much. We feel so blessed, you know, and uh, um, I, I was saying that I've never felt this kind of love before. You know, I, I have two adult children, but at that point in my life, I was working a lot and and love them deeply, but now uh, I, I have the privilege of being at home more, and it's unbelievable. These, you know, uh, the and, and this is relevant. You know, uh, I'm sitting there with this baby on my lap, and he's just totally helpless and goo goo eyeing me. You know, and I'm thinking he doesn't have a clue 
of what my world is like, right? He doesn't know what I, as an adult, I'm all the things I'm thinking of and all the things I'm doing. It's just not possible for that little brain that's just come onto the planet to resonate with that. And I was thinking, I wonder if that's the way it is for me with God. However, I think about God, but uh, about the divine, that it's just not possible for humans in their everyday life to have a taste of the divine. I don't know. I don't know, but it certainly resonated with me there. And I just fell more in love with this boy than ever before. Amazing. Well, look, we're really excited to have you on here on the show and to, uh, you know, we've been had this theme of the reinvention of medicine this year. And I think, you know, you've been such a powerful voice over the years for really having, um, you know, to, to be in reality. Uh, if we're going to be practicing medicine and we're going to be talking about chronic disease reinvention, you know, to be in reality about what's driving chronic disease outcomes. And so I wanted to just start with for you to share with our audience, you know, I know you're, you're a voracious reader of the literature and what is some literature in the last couple of years that, that you've come across that you think every clinician, not just functional medicine clinicians, but as functional medicine becomes the operating system for the future of medicine, you know, what, what things do clinicians need to be in reality about that perhaps they're not in reality about today? I think there's two studies that will help us with our paradigm. And, and how we look at this world. And the thing I've talked about for so many years is wheat-related disorders, the, the development of autoimmune diseases. And there's two studies that have come out. The first one is from our mutual friend and mentor, Alessio Fasano. And you know the guy chairs the Department of Pediatric Gastroenterology at Mass General, Harvard. He chairs the Celiac Research Center at Harvard. He chairs the Mucosal Immunology Center, Research Center at Harvard. I mean, any one of these uh, positions is a lifelong dream for people at the top of the field. And he's got a number of them. There, there are more I just, I'm not referencing. And he came out with a paper this year. And you know, people at that level are always squeaky clean on the language they use. They have to be really careful because they're easily misquoted and they'll drop his name for their product or for their test or for their line of thinking. So he's always really careful of his language, as you know, when you've interviewed him before. So the title of a paper that came out recently, all disease begins in the parentheses leaky gut, the, the etiology of chronic inflammatory diseases. That's the title of the paper coming from Fasano. You know, he's saying the same thing that Hippocrates said 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago. All disease begins in the gut. And Fasano talks about five pillars in the development of chronic inflammatory diseases. And I would ask everyone who's watching this, what comes into your office that's not a chronic inflammatory condition, right? As far as I know, almost everything is, unless it's trauma. And Fasano talks about the five pillars in the development of chronic inflammatory diseases. Number one, the genetics. No surprise there. You've got to have a gene for whatever's going to manifest. Number two, the environmental trigger that activates the gene. And I've stopped the language, turning on genes, turning off genes, because that's not what happens. Genes operate on dimmer switches and you ramp up the gene or you calm down the gene, but you don't turn it on and off, you know? So environmental triggers, which talks to the volume of what is impacting on a gene, right? And if you cross a threshold, which we call oral tolerance, when you cross that threshold, now it's ramped up that any exposure ramps up that gene to be more inflammatory, right? And I'm assuming that our listeners have been hearing some of these concepts in bits, as, bits and pieces in the past. Number three, the environmental triggers alter the microbiome and you create a dysbiotic gut. Number four, the dysbiotic gut creates intestinal permeability. Pathogenic intestinal permeability, allowing macromolecules to get through into the bloodstream 
And number five, the systemic inflammatory response. So he, he just so well lays out the sequential order of where our chronic inflammatory diseases come from. You can't do anything about the gene. We can do everything about ramping it up or toning it down. We can do a, a, everything about dysbiosis and rebuilding a diverse, healthy microbiome, which then goes into play to address um, uh, pathogenic intestinal permeability, which then dims down what I call the gasoline on the fire systemically, which is systemic inflammation. So that's a big picture paradigm view of whatever comes into your office. And I, I like it so much because it's, it's so consistent with the functional medicine concept that we're looking at what are the triggers that set off what a person comes into you with. And if we look from there, we've got a really good uh, overview from which to start zeroing down. What he also said in the article is that gluten, he refers to gluten, and there are other studies that talk about other components of wheat, wheat amylase trypsin inhibitors, as an example, glutenins, uh, for the same thing, but Fasano talks about gluten, activates toll-like receptor four. Now, toll-like receptor four is the sentry standing guard just inside, inside the proximal part of the small intestine. Now, toll-like receptor all over the body, but for this discussion, just inside the first part of the small intestine. Why? Because our ancestors, their primary function, there were three, one, find food to eat, two, shelter, three, safety, right? So they'd find food, they'd smell it, they'd nibble on it, and then they'd eat it. And if there were pathogens that they couldn't smell or taste, but enough pathogens that came down into the stomach, if hydrochloric acid doesn't kill the pathogen and it comes into the proximal part of the small intestine, Toll-like receptor four is standing right there, the sentry standing guard, to activate two mechanisms. First, NF-kappa B, the major amplifier of inflammation, gets activated, so you get an inflammatory response right there locally in the gut. And second, zonulin release gets activated by toll-like receptor four, so you get water coming into the intestines to wash out whatever that threat is. What Fasano tells us is that the two most powerful triggers to this whole mechanism are lipopolysaccharides from uh, pathogenic bacteria and gluten. Gluten activates toll-like receptor four in all individuals who eat wheat. Now, read Fasano. It doesn't matter if you feel bad when you eat it, you are activating toll-like receptor four in all humans. And so he would say on stage, you, you may have heard him say, if, if you're human, this happens to you. Now, the question is tolerance, when you lose tolerance. Because when you lose tolerance, now the whole inflammatory cascade begins. So you can activate the toll-like receptor for the sentry standing guard, and it's a minor little irritation that goes away, but it's the volume. And when you cross the line of tolerance and you lose what's called oral tolerance, any exposures now start this whole cascade that ends up with pathogenic intestinal permeability, systemic inflammation, and whatever your genetics are for rheumatoid arthritis, chronic fatigue, compromised immune system, depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, it doesn't matter, you know, wh wherever your genetics are. I think, uh, you know, this year has really showcased that and that mechanism, particularly with, with COVID, because ultimately now there's more and more science showing that if you have that mechanism going on in the body, the results from the same infection are like uh, worse. Does that tolerance reduce because of just age or because of the amount of gluten eaten over a lifetime? 
I've not seen a study that talks about the amount of gluten eaten over a lifetime being the trigger. I've not seen that. I don't think that's the case. I think it's the unbelievable amount of environmental toxins that humans are exposed to now as never before in history. Ever have we been exposed to this so much more than 10 years ago. And we ignore this or we don't put attention on this. But the phthalates in the air from plastic blinds, you know, and the phthalates and nail polish that are in your bloodstream in three to five minutes. I mean, the list goes on and on. And it's all yeah. of these environmental toxins that activate our immune system trying to protect us that take us over the level of tolerance. So even the more annoying little irritants that can trigger the sentry say, hey, well, who are you? Um, if that's where wheat is in terms of a priority, not much at all, even the annoying little ones. When you're on high alert because there's so many toxins in your life that you're trying to fight, even the annoying ones become a problem. That's such an interesting thing. So I love that from Pisano. So that's a great foundation and ultimately gives a real um, credibility to why functional medicine must be the operating system for the future of chronic disease because it understands dysbiosis and it understands environmental toxins. So that's the first study. What was the second study? The second study came out just, um, let me check the date here so I'm clear with you, uh, March of 2020. And they looked at 86,000 306 children in Norway. It was called the Norwegian Mother and Child Cohort Study. And they followed these kids from 1999 all the way through to April 15th of 2018. And they followed 86,000 kids. And they looked for the hazard ratio, meaning the likelihood of developing a particular disease. In this case, it was type one diabetes, the autoimmune type one diabetes from gluten exposure. And these were not celiacs. They didn't look at their genes, uh, just 86,000 kids. And they followed the mother's intake of gluten through week 22 of pregnancy and the offspring gluten intake in the first 18 months of life. And they followed these kids for an average of 12 years. That was the average. And what they found was that for every 10 grams of gluten eaten by these children, it was a 46% increased risk of developing type one diabetes. Now, a slice of whole wheat bread is somewhere between two to four grams. So for every 10 grams that they ate in a day, it was a 46% increased risk of developing type one diabetes. These are not celiacs. These are just kids, you know, and you think of what kids are eating today, you know, these big uh, pretzels, you know, the, uh, and if we eat a bowl of pasta. Honey so, nut Cheerios. Honey nut Cheerios, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and you know, the list goes on, tricks. Tricks are for kids. Yeah, right. They're 50.4% sugar, uh, but, what this shows us is that irrespective of a genetic vulnerability to a sensitivity to wheat, even those not carrying those genes had 46% increased risk of developing type one diabetes. Jaw dropping. Really Jaw dropping. Yeah, so, so okay, now we're in reality about, about that. Ultimately, yeah. I wanna make sure that, that all the clinicians here, you know, understand, you know, one, how that needs to be factored into their education. And maybe it's not actually clinicians doing it, but like, you know, further out, you know, with your, with your communications as a clinic or as a, as a doctor. But then second is, you know, what do we, what do we do about it clinically in the short term? Like, are there strategies that we can use from a functional medicine perspective to, you know, to reduce the chances of um, that kind of effect happening? There are two, James, there are two big ones. The first one is of course, reduce exposure uh, um, and rebuild the microbiome. That is primary. If there's only one thing someone's going to do in their life for their patient, because this patient's not gonna comply with much of anything, if there's only one thing the person's gonna do, teach them how to rebuild their microbiome. I know of nothing that has as great an impact as doing that. 
And there are a number of steps to that. And uh, I thought we, we, we could review some of the steps in that one. Yeah, let's review those quickly, yeah. Yeah, the first one is Mrs. Patient. Every, when you go shopping for vegetables, always organic, of course, many reasons, and you'll educate them about glyphosate and GMO and all of that. Uh, but buy a couple of every root vegetable in the store. Every root vegetable, rutabagas, turnips, parsnips, carrots, radishes, uh, sweet potatoes, not too many white potatoes because of the glycemic index, but every, every root vegetable and have one root vegetable a day because root vegetables are the fibers that feed the probiotics in your gut, the good guys in your gut. And you don't wanna just eat turnips every day because every root vegetable feeds different families of probiotics in your gut. So you wanna alternate and you're training your patient that lifestyle has everything to do with their health, not just take a pill, right? Um, and it's great to take prebiotic powders in smoothies and things, and that's really helpful. And for a couple of months, we'll do that with most of our patients. But the emphasis is to teach them lifestyle changes that last a lifetime. So the first one is one root vegetable every day, at least one root vegetable every day, and alternate them. The second one is one fermented vegetable every day whether it's sauerkraut, kimchi, miso, fermented beets, whatever, curry flavored, but every day a forkful of fermented vegetables because every vegetable when it's fermenting is generating different families of probiotics and you're inoculating with these probiotics. And you don't just eat sauerkraut every day, you know, change it out because of the different families and species that you're doing with different uh, pro, uh, fermented vegetables and different probiotics. The third thing, perhaps one of the most powerful enzymes, and we're going to talk more about enzymes today, but one of the most powerful enzymes for gut health is intestinal alkaline phosphatase. IAP reduces metabolic toxemia, meaning the amount of LPS that gets into the bloodstream by up to 75%. It reduces total cholesterol levels if they're elevated. It reduces total triglycerides if they're elevated. It stabilizes insulin sensitivity. Um, the, uh, it, it enhances probiotic adhesion to the epithelial lining of the gut. It uh, produces bacterial sidens to kill pathogens. Intestinal alkaline phosphatase is our best friend in our gut. It's got many, many functions. And we want to increase that enzyme in our gut. We want to ramp it up. And how do you do that? Pectin increases intestinal alkaline phosphatase dramatically. So Mrs. Patient, when you go shopping for your fruits and vegetables, buy a bunch of apples, always organic, of course, and wash them and dice them, get rid of the seeds, dice them up, throw them in a pot. And if the amount of apples is about this high, you add one third water. So add water to about a third the height of the apples, throw a little cinnamon in there, a couple of raisins, turn it on high, let it boil 10, 12 minutes or so. When you see a shine on the skin of the apple, it's done. The shine is pectin being released from the meat and the underskin of the apple. So the pectin is now easily accessible when your patient eats the applesauce. The pectin is easily accessible in the proximal part of the small intestine and increases intestinal alkaline phosphatase. So when you read a little about intestinal alkaline phosphatase, your jaw drops as to how important this is for a balanced, um, uh, uh, diverse microbiome, critically important. And having a couple of tablespoons a day is all it takes. Has to be fresh. You can't get the commercial stuff. Um, um, pectin counts low in the commercial, but when you make it fresh, and if you do it with your kids, it's a project. They like it. They give it to their friends, you know, and all of that. 
I really appreciate you, you know, sharing some of those strategies. And I'm sure, you know, whether you're a, a, a doctor practicing functional medicine or you, you're a health professional, you know, sort of as an allied health profession, uh, running your own practice, or even the more and more doctors that are showing up, you know, to these ideas in in different um, sort of names. We're seeing, you know, different types of doctors showing up now into this ecosystem because I think COVID has really showed them that they they don't really understand the vulnerabilities that their patients have, and so all are welcome to this community. I guess, you know, I wanted to just get your particular insight on this theme of reinvention of medicine and. Just, uh, you know, for, on, as a last uh, piece here, you know, this whole year, we're gonna be talking about this reinvention. Obviously you've, you've shared some ideas here about what it would mean to reinvent with particularly this topic, but I know you're a, you're a clear thinker on this topic and I'd love to just get your, your views on what the reinvention of medicine looks like from your perspective. From my perspective, the reinvention of medicine is empowering our patients with the realization it's lifestyle that has created these chronic inflammatory diseases. It's lifestyle. And unfortunately, our, our, our tribes have grown up in a world that tells them it's okay to eat dot, dot, dot. You know, it's okay to have these environmental exposures because the government says it's safe. You know, just go back to the 1950s and read the articles in the major newspapers that the mushroom clouds uh, coming out of Nevada were safe with above ground nuclear explosions and that cigarettes were safe and that margarine was safe. You know, it goes on and on when it's uh, corporate drive. And I think the reinvention here is for people to understand going back towards, I don't wanna be hokey and say back to nature, but going back to simple foods has a tremendous role to play in vibrant uh, 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 vitality. Tremendous role to play. And people just don't know this. And so many people now don't know how to cook. They, they, they have no experience with that. And so as we come up with our programs, our group sessions, um, putting in just little bits and pieces of what is easy for them to begin with, empowering them, and we can take them through programs that get a little more intense, a little more intense, a little more intense, as they become more experienced and engaged in this process. Beautiful. Doc, thanks so much for being here and part of the Functional Forum. We you know, appreciate over the years playing a pretty central role in the Functional Forum, both as a as a uh, as talent and as a communicator and also one time as a host from India which is amazing and that's a great episode if you want to go back and see some of the giants of uh, you know of autoimmune disease, disease like Yehuda Schoenfeld um, who's becoming more and more relevant I would say every day um, as medicine progresses in this direction thank you for your support over the years and uh, excited for the new addition to your family and thanks so much for being part of the, this episode thank you James really a pleasure All right, so that was Dr. Tom O'Brien. Uh, hopefully, you guys all learned something there. So, so much wisdom, and you know, boiling it down for how to make it easy for your patients to participate um, in this kind of uh, in this uh, operating system of medicine. So, uh, just before we get on to the next speaker, who is Dr. Christine Burke, I just wanted to share with you um, next week we are going to start our podcast series you know this year we did a whole podcast series on marketing we started last year and we taught we've done a 10 episode series all the way from niching and you know information marketing we've done stuff on facebook ads facebook groups uh, we've done stuff on this last month uh, we heard from those two um uh, medical students who had gone viral on TikTok with over 400 million views of their hashtag and 1.6 million followers. So if you haven't checked out that, make sure to go and check out the podcast. Next month, we're starting, uh, or this month, should I say, next week, we're going to start uh, our new uh, new model, which is our new theme, which is our new models. So new models um, to sort of aid this reinvention. And we're going to kick it off next week with uh, a special um, intro from Dr. David Tusek, who runs a world class direct primary care clinic in uh, Boulder County, Colorado, three locations called Cloud Medical. 
and he has written this ebook called Salutogenic Eudaimonics. And when I was recording the podcast, it was much longer than any podcast I've recorded before. It's about an hour and a half. But I just want to encourage everyone out there to listen to it because I think more than anything, what he's able to do is really share the heartbreak that medicine has become. Right. Why so many people end up coming to functional medicine because of so many reasons to do with the heartbreak of being a doctor in the modern world, and especially here in America. And this ebook, Salutogenic Eudaimonics, we're going to be giving away to everyone who listens. And I highly recommend um, reading it. It was one of the most profound things that I read last year. I've been really excited about this new models. In the new model series, we're going to talk about new clinical models, new payment models. Uh, Dr. Tusek is a direct primary care doctor and is going to be talking about the benefits of the membership. We're going to be talking about um, new clinical models. We're even going to be talking about new innovative models of doing functional medicine. Like how do we make this more affordable? How do we make this uh, more accessible? So um, my highest recommendation is to watch out for that podcast and check it out. The 10 heartbreaks of medicine. Um, and we'll be giving away this ebook, which is uh, really, really powerful. All right, so Tom mentioned a little bit there about uh, toxins and he spoke about that. Now we hear a lot about toxins in lots of other ways, but not as it relates to the gut, but it's a critical importance. So I'm really excited to have um, as our next speaker here, Dr. Christine Burke. She's been on the forum a couple of times before, um, but she is a long serving functional medicine uh, leader. Um, she runs the Fulston Functional Forum uh, from even before it was a functional forum. I just wanna give one caveat to this content is that two weeks ago, I got hit in the face by a cricket ball, playing cricket, um, long story but my face is a bit mangled for a couple of weeks there. So I recorded this when I was doing that. So don't be shocked when you see it, but uh, enjoy this awesome interview with Dr. Christine Burke. So a warm welcome back to the Functional Forum, Dr. Christine Burke, welcome doc. Thank you, nice to be here, James. Good to be with you too. So this time last year, we were doing that event in Davis, your alma mater, and uh, you gave a great presentation there on environment environmental toxins and health, which I think was new to a lot of medical students, but um, was really well received. You know, we've been on this theme of uh, reinvention of medicine and particularly looking at the GI tract. And, um, you know, I know when we had a chance to, to discuss about it, it seems like uh, it's not always the most thought of way that it, it impacts the GI tract, but toxins in the GI tract have uh, a, a relationship of such. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, so often when we're thinking about environmental toxins and how um, those toxicants impact the body, we're looking at things like the neurologic system and, you know, brain health, and we're looking at chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia and, and how it affects the mitochondria, or we're looking at endocrine effects and the endocrine disruptors. And those are all very important, but I think that, you know, especially in the last year, there've been quite a few studies that have been published looking at how different chemical toxins can actually affect the microbiome of the gut and then the downstream effects that that has on health in general, because we all know that that's where it all begins. Yeah, it's interesting because we're always looking for the mechanism of, of uh, toxic interaction, right? And so I think that this is probably something that's not that well understood. So yeah, I'd love to understand just from your research and your, your clinical practice as well, where are the ways in which environmental chemicals get interact with the microbiome and, uh, and, and how, do, how can we understand that from a clinical point of view? Yeah, so I think one of the one of the more common ones that we're probably all exposed to is glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup, and uh, we know that we want to try to avoid that with eating organic. And but the glyphosate itself actually affects a, a biochemical pathway, an enzyme that is found also in many of the bacterial species, and that pathway, the shikimate pathway is critical to the metabolism of the bacteria. And so when we're ingesting foods that have been contaminated with glyphosate, we're impacting the microbiome at a different level than just it being something that's inflammatory or something that's altering um, altering the, the community itself, right? We're actually individually targeting the health of those bacteria. And I don't think that we often think about it. We think about it getting absorbed through the gut, 
and then what impact that might have on our system once it gets absorbed. But there's that whole nother level where we see that impact as it's starting, as it's coming in through the gut. And would that be like fruits and vegetables sprayed with it directly? Or would you see that broader in like packaged foods that are using, I don't know, corn and soy and that kind of stuff? Yeah, exactly. All of those things, like all of the breakfast cereals that were tested and found to have glyphosate, which I think was literally almost every single one on the shelf. And then um, non-organic foods, or if you're, you know, what what you do in your leisure time, if you're out playing golf, if you're, you know, if you're eating wheat, because wheat is pre-treated with glyphosate to induce the germ to, to germinate, but a couple of weeks before it's harvested. So wheat has a lot of glyphosate contamination. So a lot of ways that we can get exposure to that, but it's not just glyphosate. We have, you know, like arsenic, for example, that can be a common contaminant in groundwater. And so there was a study published looking at mice that were fed a very modest amount of arsenic, like the amount that you would find in some drinking water samples over a four week period. And they had a substantial shift in their microbiome community. And these are things that are just starting to get looked at, how it's affecting us from that point forward, as opposed to just once it's a part of the body. I'm glad that there are studies that are showing things over a period of time, because I'm sure that that kind of stuff uh, builds up. When I first came to America, I would played a lot of cricket growing up. And one of the things that you do in cricket is you you lick your fingers and you put it on the ball and you wipe the ball to try and make it sort of move in the air. And when I first came to America, I did a test and found that my pesticide levels were off the charts because, you know, those environments are very uh, and that happened over like you know, 10 years of playing the sport. So I can see that those kind of toxic buildups can can happen. You mentioned food there, you mentioned water. Are there any other ways in which these toxins kind of arrive in the GI? So uh, one thing that we don't necessarily think about is that the things we breathe also end up being swallowed. So, you know, our nasal cavity is designed to be a filter. And when it filters those things out, they don't necessarily just fall out of us because they've been filtered, right? They get moved through with the cilia into the back of the throat, and then they get swallowed. And one of the main examples that we see often is with mold toxicity. So mold, you know, we usually think of molds as being an inhalant problem because the spores get released into the air, but they get filtered and then both the spores and the mycotoxins they get they produce are then swallowed. And so much of our mycotoxin exposure actually comes from that swallowing. So all of that is moving through the gut. And we see problems with that. I mean, we know from penicillin that many mycotoxins are antibiotics. So that's a problem to begin with. And then we also know that mycotoxins can damage the migrating motor complex of the small intestine and all of the problems that can result from that. We can see increases in heartburn. We can see the development of SIBO, for example, um, problems with constipation, all kinds of downstream effects that are actually direct effects on the gut by the toxins. That's super interesting. Yeah, I didn't I didn't really uh, understand that mechanism, but it it certainly makes uh, a lot of sense. Is there any other category that is affecting the microbiome um, and and the toxic connection there? Um, Well, we have I mean, certainly the microbiome is participant in the transformation of chemicals. So their their role in the detoxification process of chemical toxins or toxicants before they get absorbed into the body is also being affected not only by specific chemicals, arsenic, for example, is one that can do that, but but the accumulated burden of chemicals that we have is going to affect just in the same way, if you think about it, we always talk about the detox process in the liver and how our genetics determine our capacity for detoxification. And the same is true in our microbiome, we may be able to, or they may be able to handle a certain load of toxic exposure, but chronic exposure over time or large burdens of exposure like 
say having your mercury amalgams removed in a conventional way instead of by a biologic dentist, those large loads of swallowed toxins are going to affect that ability. And then that's going to increase our uptake of those toxins as well. One of the things that I came to know when I got into this world was this idea that of, of nutrient um, depletion from pharmaceuticals. And there's all kinds of tools that you can use now to put in what drugs you've taken and see what's caused. Is there a mechanism in there that's to do with, with the microbiome? Like, ah, if you take Tylenol every day for 10 years, like, is that, is that, is the microbiome playing a role in that pathway? Boy, that's a really good question. I don't directly know the answer to that, but I would, I mean, I would imagine that that would definitely have an impact. I mean, we see that different drugs can impact the microbiome, not all of them necessarily, or at least we haven't discovered that all of them do, but we see that that impact can happen, but I haven't come across anything yet that was clearly saying that this, this thing over time, other than the one that I mentioned with the, with the arsenic over time. And obviously, you know, antibiotics would be a pretty obvious example of messing with the uh, with myth the microbiome. But I think that's the most obvious one. <laughs> it is the most obvious one. I didn't even think of it because it's so obvious. We all know that antibiotics create a lot of problems there. And we're also seeing, you know, more of the water contaminated with pharmaceuticals and higher levels of pharmaceuticals. And in our local paper just this week, there was an article about um, a researcher in Marin County who's looking at the specific cancer in sea lions and that exposure coming from the, the water, from the seawater. And so apparently about 20 years ago, there was a lot of effluent of diazinon and diazinon byproducts that were being shed off into the, into the ocean. And now they're finding a rate of this one particular cancer, which I, sorry, I can't recall off the top of my head, um, but about 25% of the sea lions are now affected by this one particular cancer and they've traced it back to the diazinon. So the water supply is a, is a huge potential source of exposure for us. And one of the reasons that we talk a lot about drinking filtered water. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so you have a patient now in front of you, you recognize that there may be some toxic exposure through some of those different pathways in there. What are some of your best tips for moving that all out and reducing the sort of whole body effect of, um, of uh, the microbiome um, being affected by toxins? Yeah, so I, I we all know about how important it is to do periodic detoxes. And I, sh I shared with you that I'm on day four of my detox right now. So hopefully my brain is is with me. But doing a periodic detox, like a 10 day detox can be really helpful for offloading chemicals and then eating from all of the colorful fruits and vegetables, particularly the dark leafy greens, the crucifers that are gonna give us our detox support. But on the entry side, looking at, um, one of the things I really, really like is, we all know about the environmental working group and their work in identifying the chemical burden, both in our food supply and our agriculture, and then also in our products, our personal care products, our cleaning products. And so there's an app called Think Dirty, Live Clean. It used to be only called Think Dirty. And I can tell you, I got a lot of crazy looks when I would recommend that app to patients. <laughs> but um, it's really nice because it has a little barcode scanner. You can scan products right while you're in the store and get the ranking. It doesn't have everything, but it has a lot. So that's a great way to start reducing that exposure. You know, the statistics are that the average woman applies about 168 chemicals a day to her to her body and the skin's just another way of absorbing it like the GI tract so we've got to reduce the chemical load there so I love that app I love EWG's skin deep for that as well of course following the dirty dozen and the clean 15 that's going to help reduce our load there was a great study that they did in Sweden in fact, I have a video of it in the course I teach down at Loma Linda, and it was looking at a family of four and they had they tested all of their urine, measured their toxins, and then they completely replaced their pantry with all organic products, had them eat only from those things for the next two weeks and then retested them. And it was like the levels just dropped like a rock. So eating organic definitely has a big impact on our chemical acquisition. 
filtering water, you know, drinking water that's filtered so that we're eliminating the chemicals. That's another big one. And then of course, being really judicious with whatever medications that we choose to use. Great. Well, God bless the environmental working group. They do a lot of great stuff for all of us. So thanks for sharing that. So just before we wrap up here, thank you for, for sharing all of that. I just want to acknowledge that, you know, you've obviously been doing this functional medicine for a long time. We're here now in this moment of the reinvention of medicine. And not only have you been a doctor, but also a community organizer, you know, running the Folsom uh, meetup even predates the functional forum. One of the first <laughs> practitioner meetups that there was that I was uh, grateful to attend, I think back in like 2013, 14, mm -hmm. and just seeing, you know, that continue over the years. I would love to just, you know, get your, your thoughts on the reinvention of medicine and our theme uh, for this year. Yeah, I think, you know, there's so much to do where, you know, you're great at figuring out where we all begin. I think COVID has really illustrated and emphasized the importance of looking at health as its own entity, as opposed to just waiting until we have a diagnosis of disease. And I, I you know, nowhere else has that been more apparent than in the differential effect of, of COVID in different pre-existing conditions. So I think we're going to have more of a focus on how do we create health, which is what we've all been about for a long time. And I think that we've talked a lot, you and I, about how important it is to bring the group learning experience, both in terms of extending the reach of the practitioner versus the one on one experience, which limits what we can share. And then also just from the perspective of what patients learn from each other, we're doing the detox that we're doing right now as a group detox in our practice and just seeing, you know, when we have our small meetups, how people are learning from each other and learning ideas about how to cook and how much interest there is in trying to cook in a more healthful way and how little people know and understand about that in the in the general community at large obviously there's people who are very talented and skilled at that but it surprises me how many people say you know i don't know how to cook or i don't cook and it's like how, you you can't be healthy if you're not willing to prepare food to nourish your body you you can't so that's been really interesting. So I think more of a focus on food first, um, one of the big movements that that we've had. And we're fortunate, you and I, to live in a farm to table capital where that's really, it's readily available to us. And that's not true for everyone. But I think that's going to be a part of it too. Yeah, it's a big, it's a, it's a whole systemic fix for sure. And um, yeah, I think one thing you mentioned there that really resonates is the need to fill this education gap. And I know that you've been filling that education gap in, in Folsom and El Dorado for, for years and, and on a sort of broader spectrum with, with practitioners too. And I think, you know, it's a, it's a great example for other doctors and practitioners around the country. When you fill that education gap for your local community, mm -hmm. you have a successful practice because you become that leader. And so thank you for modeling that for us over the years, Dr. Burke. And thanks so much for being part of the Functional Forum. Thank you so much, James. All right, Dr. Christine Burke, thank you so much uh, for you know sharing your wisdom here on the Functional Forum. Uh, Dr. Burke has been a uh, an incredible uh, supporter over the years for the Functional Forum with her meetup groups, and also um, is an incredible educator. Uh, so yeah, I want to talk a little bit about you know what we were talking about there at the end, which is. Uh, filling that education gap and and really what does it take to you know to have functional medicine become the standard of care and I, I mentioned something in my email on Saturday about if you've ever heard Dr. Jeffrey Bland lecture uh, you've heard him talk about functional medicine as this virus that gets like implanted into your brain and then once you you know once you uh once it's in there it replicates you know through lots of different ways and it's you know it's hard to shake off you feel like committed that you really want to practice in this way and so i just want to share you know from from our perspective it's all about taking functional medicine viral one way or another so that's why you know we wanted to increase transmission right from between practitioners to practitioners and that's why we started the meetup groups and that's why we're really committed to the meetup groups and you'll see more and more things coming out next year about our commitment to uh to those meetup groups and really looking to try and grow that in a much more sustainable way and that's for the practitioner to practitioner transmission and obviously these shows trying to make it easy uh, for any practitioner anywhere in the world, any doctor to start to find out about functional medicine without going to a conference, without forking over any money, 
just like understanding a little bit about what functional medicine is and uh, and how to go from there. So that's the first the first piece. Now the the second piece is you know the second and third piece in the increase of the transmission is from doctor to patient, right? And then from patient to patient. And so you know from doctor to patient we really have to think about community as marketing and marketing to get the practice out there to, to talking about reducing the education gap. And that's why I want to take a moment just to talk about our practice accelerators. The 1st of March, twice a year, we open up the practice accelerator. So we just finished our February intake. You know, if you're watching this right now and you feel like you missed the boat, feel free to get in touch. We might be able to add you into, into this intake, but ultimately, the accelerator was there really to help practitioners understand how to close that gap, right? And over this last year in the marketing podcast and so forth, we've really showcased those practitioners who've done an effective job consistently at closing that education gap. Now, what does that look like? The first thing is you have to work out what you're going to communicate. And, you know, Dr. Tusek, who I mentioned earlier, and there's, there's plenty of ways that you can build a successful practice as a super generalist. A generalist is super generous through you know, functional medicine and, and see a range of patients. But if you're talking about marketing and getting the word out there, it's super helpful to be able to be known for something. So when practitioners come to us, you know, we like to share with them that like, think about the first 100, 200, 500 patients. Where are they gonna come from? What are you gonna be known for? And ultimately, you know, I wanna share with you sort of like the five parts that we've seen to build a successful practice. So the first thing is really understanding who you're gonna serve, right? Who are they gonna be the first 100 people that come through your door and why are they gonna to come to you? And that's really about getting clear as to the sort of, um, you know, the, the segment or the niche of functional medicine that you want to serve. So that's the crucial first thing and, and, um, and, and go there. Then the second part is the model. And so in that Dr. Tusek podcast, you're going to hear about the benefit of his model, which is an $80 a month monthly membership, right? So that's $80 a month, pretty affordable for most people, half the price of Parsley Health. But, you know, he talks a little bit about why they chose that amount and what services you get for that and how functional medicine-y is it really. Um, but that's a, a membership model. A lot of our practitioners are choosing to do uh packages of care rather than fee for service where you get one commitment for like a six month episode of care you get the money up front and then you ex ex execute that episode of care more and more we are starting to see because of changes in the 2021 coding laws some practitioners thinking about you know going back to insurance which i know will cause ptsd for a lot of practitioners but this is something that we're actively looking at to see like, is it reasonable for doctors to start to go back onto insurance? Are the changes in the 2021 coding reasonable to have doctors think about going in, in that direction? And the answer really is yes. And we'll have some more stuff on that um, as time goes on. Um, and we're just looking into some of those things right now and um, you know executing some pilots with some practitioners too. So that's uh, the second phase is really getting the model right. And in that model, one of the things we're going to talk about is part three, which is patient to patient, but I'll get to that in a minute. Module three is all about your technology stack. So making sure that you have the right technology in place to be able to deliver this low overhead, high touch medicine. And so, you know, even years before the pandemic, we're talking about telemedicine, talking about, you know, scheduling online, talking about, you know, what are the ways that you can take your care beyond the four walls of your practice? And so we go through in that the 12 tech tools that we see that to run an effective practice. Module four is all about automated education, right? So educating if someone comes, if someone comes across, you come across them, how do you educate people consistently so that you put your best foot forward and everyone knows what this person does? Um, and that's a big part. And, you know, you can set up an education system that you can set it and forget it. And that every new person that comes to your website, every person you meet out in the community can get your best foot forward and understanding if you're for them. And then part five is marketing. And just last week, uh, we shared a resource from Dr. Uli Isolo 
from the evolution of medicine about the use of Facebook groups and how you can use Facebook groups to bring people into your practice, to warm them up as a community, take advantage of social proof and uh, make it easy for people to join your practice. So that's the five steps of the practice accelerator. We've had almost a thousand doctors come through over the last four years. Um, if you're going into private practice, there's no better value for money in the uh, community. If you go to goevomed.com slash accelerator, you can find out more about the practice accelerator. We'd love to um, chat with you about it there. The third way that we are going to change the transmission of this functional medicine virus is by the delivery of a new model of care that I believe is the group visit model. It's why I wrote this book, The Community Cure. This book is opening up all kinds of um, opportunities to get into the blue ocean of medicine, right? How do we get most doctors to practice some sort of functional medicine or offer some sort of functional medicine? This group dynamic is really um, is bringing it to the fore. There's so many ways that we can deliver uh, you know, individualized medicine in a group format. I know that sounds crazy, but it's definitely possible using the group format to facilitate peer-to-peer -peer interactions, to get people to actually make the behavior changes necessary for long-term health reclamation. Right. This is absolutely critical. We go into some of this inside the fun inside the accelerator too um, about group visits. And we've been making content about that for three years. Um, so if you are interested in finding out more about the accelerator, go evomed.com slash accelerator. You can book a time uh, with uh, one of our faculty. You can talk about it. I won't talk about it again until September because ultimately twice a year we bring people into the accelerator in September. We'll have some more exciting uh, news about what's new inside the accelerator community. In the meantime, you know, thank you so much for being here as part of our reinvention of medicine. We're super, super focused on the gut for this first quarter, because you can see if you've learned nothing from this first quarter is that the gut is going to be central to, to the transformation of medicine. If you look at these fully developed operating systems of medicine that have come ayurveda you know chinese medicine naturopathy you know the gut is is right at the center of it and we think there's a lot of wisdom there to build on thank you so much for being part of the functional forum i'm going to go and enjoy the rest of my time with my daughter thanks so 